from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me tonight to the third chapter of John's Gospel. This man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night, probably afraid of criticism, or he had a desire for a private conversation, or maybe he wanted to give some more thought before committing himself to Jesus Christ. In any event, he came, and he asked Jesus some questions about spiritual life, and Jesus looked him up and down, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. In fact, he said, verily, verily, and any time that Jesus uses that expression, that means that what is going to follow is very important. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must, you have to be born again if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. Two years ago when we were touring Poland, while we were there, we met a priest, a Monsignor, who is head of one of the largest theological seminaries in the world. And he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, I got my Ph.D. degree at the University of Chicago. And one day, I was riding in a bus, and sitting behind me was a black woman. And she punched me on the shoulder, and she said, Sir, I beg your pardon, but have you ever been born again? And he said, Well, I suppose I have. He said, I'm a, I'm a priest. She said, That's not the question I ask you, sir. I ask you, had you been born again? And he said, Well, I, 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 uh, she said, have you been born again? And he said he went back to his rooms at the, at the university and got his Bible down and turned to the third chapter of John and reread this passage. And this passage spoke to him, and he said he got on his knees and he had an experience with Christ that he's never been able to get away from. Now, he said, my theology would tell me that I was probably born again at a different period but he said, something happened. You can call it anything you want to, commitment, recommitment, conversion, whatever. Something happened to me. Now, the question I want to ask you tonight is, has that ever happened to you? Give it some other title, some other name, if you want. Call it conversion, call it commitment, call it repentance, call it faith, call it whatever. Has it ever happened to you? Many of you have thought a long time about religion and Christianity. Are you committed? Are you committed to Jesus Christ? Jesus said, you must be born again. Start with your hearts. Be born from above. You can be changed. The world could be changed. The country can be changed. A state can be changed. A family can be changed. A person can be changed. You can be changed. Now, Nicodemus must have been stunned when Jesus said that to him because if Christ had said that to Zacchaeus, who's a tax collector, and they didn't like tax collectors then much more than they do now. But to say it to Nicodemus, one of the great religious leaders of his time, Nicodemus, it says, was a ruler. That meant that he was rich, he was religious, and yet he was searching for reality. How many of you go to church, but you're still searching? There's still an empty place in your heart, and something tells you inside that you're not really right with God. You see, Nicodemus fasted two days a week. Do you know anybody in your church that does that? He spent two hours every day in prayer. How many people do you know that spend two hours every day in prayer? He tithed all his income. Not many people even do that these days. He was a professor at the theological school of theology, and he worked hard at religion. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again born from above. Now, why did Jesus say that to Nicodemus? Because he could read the heart of Nicodemus. He saw what was in him. He saw that he had covered himself with religion, but he had not yet found the real thing, fellowship with God. What causes all of our troubles in the world, lying and cheating and hate and prejudice and social inequality and ultimately war? Jesus said, these things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. He said, it's in our heart. He said, our hearts need to be changed. Psychologists and sociologists and psychiatrists all recognize there's something wrong with man. There are many words in Scripture to describe it. There, I'll take only three words. 
One is called a transgression. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is a transgression of the law. What law? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Have you ever broken one of those commandments? Then you're guilty of all. It's also the breaking of the law of conscience. Have you ever gone against your conscience at any time? Sure you have. And if you go against your conscience very long, your conscience becomes dull and duller and duller until after a while it's a seared conscience and a dead conscience. And your conscience is no longer a safe guide to go by. It leads you astray because you've gone against it so much. And then there's another one, a commandment, law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength and mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Have you always done that? No. Then you're a sinner in need of forgiveness, in need of being born again. And then another word carries with it the idea of missing the mark or coming short of your duty and a failure to do what you ought to do. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And yet before you can get to heaven, you must, you must have righteousness. God says be perfect as I'm perfect, holy as I'm holy. Where are you going to get that perfection? You don't have it now. Where are you going to get that holiness? You don't have it now. But you can't get to heaven if you don't. That's why Christ died on the cross. He died on the cross and shed his blood to provide the righteousness for you so that he provides you with the right kind of clothing to go to heaven. And the clothes that you must have are called the clothes of righteousness. And that was provided for you by Christ. And then there's another word, iniquity, a turning aside from the straight path. Isaiah said, we are like sheep. We've gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Now, here in Idaho, I know that I think this is a sheep state, maybe the sheep state in the United States. I haven't seen any goats around yet. And maybe you have goats too. In New Zealand, they cross the sheep and the goats and they call them jeeps. That's a fact. And uh, when we were in New Zealand, I couldn't get over the fact of, of what they were doing. I don't know whether that improves them or destroys them. I don't know. But some of you don't know whether you're a sheep or a goat. Now, you see, Jesus said at the judgment, there's going to be the goats on this side and the sheep on this side. And the sheep are going to enter into the kingdom of God. Of course, there he's talking about the judgment of the nations, but it could be applied to individuals. Or it could be that you're a goat and the goats are going to be cast into outer darkness, the Bible says. But one thing, you're not spiritually. You're not a jeep. You can't be both. You have to choose which one. And if you would like to make that choice watching by television, pick up that telephone and call that number that you see on the screen right now and a counselor standing by to talk to you and to help you find Christ as your Lord and Master. Help you with your spiritual problems. They're all over the country. So call right now. And if it's busy, call again. They'll be there all evening. If the lines are tied up, keep calling. Don't give up. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Thus a radical change is needed by every person. We need those sins forgiven. We need to be clothed in the righteousness of God for the purpose of finding fulfillment in this life. Finding something to commit yourself to. What are you committed to? Are you a committed person? Do you really believe in a cause? Do you really believe in a person that symbolizes that cause? Why don't you make your cause Christ and follow him? He'll never let you down. And then not only to find complete fulfillment in this life, but also to be acceptable with God to be acceptable by God. Now, some of you would ask the question, what is the new birth? Nicodemus asked that question. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? You see, Nicodemus, like you and me, he wanted to understand it. He wanted to understand it. 
Now, I used an illustration years ago that I couldn't understand because I was born and reared on a dairy farm. And I still wake up at night with nightmares doing this way. <laughs> because I had to get up every morning during high school at 3 o'clock and milk 20 cows. And then when I came home from school, I had to milk those same 20 in the afternoon. My father had a small dairy, had about 60 cows that we milked, and then we would sell the milk door to door, have a little dairy truck that took the milk early in the morning. And that's all I remember almost as I was a boy because we worked hard on that dairy farm. But how can a black cow eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter? I don't understand that. Well, I'll tell you what, because I don't understand it, I'm never going to drink milk again. I've got to understand that before I can drink milk. I almost quit milk when the cow stepped in the bucket and it just kept on milking. <laughs> I don't understand color television. Do you know that I am so old that I can remember when there was no television? And I tell that to one of my grandchildren, they look at me as though I came out of the ark. <laughs> I can remember when there were, we didn't have any radio. In fact, I remember the first station that came on there was KDKA in Pittsburgh, and my dad had an old crystal set, and he said, I think we've got it, and got earphones, and we'd all stand around to try to listen. The only station on there in the United States. That's how old I am. Well, you can't imagine a world without paved highways. You ought to have seen the two ruts in front of our house that went clear to town. There were only two paved streets in our whole town. Well, suppose I would say, because I don't understand television, how somebody can be in Rome or New York or Jerusalem or someplace like that, and I can see him instantaneously on my set. I don't understand it. I'm not going to watch it. And I push the button to turn it off. I've got to understand it first. Why, well, you'd say you're crazy. Well, of course, I don't understand these computers. I don't understand all these things that they're developing. This whole scientific age has passed me by. We didn't study that in the school I went to. But I accept it by faith. You see, Nicodemus could see only the physical and the materialistic. And Jesus was talking about the spiritual. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, when he said that, he did not mean that you can inherit it. You cannot inherit it. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your father and mother can be the greatest born-again Christians in the world, but that doesn't make you a born-again Christian. I can be born in a garage, but that doesn't make me a motor car. <laughs> and there are many people that have the idea that because they are born in a Christian home that they're automatically Christians. Well, you're not. And you cannot work your way alone, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then reformation is not enough. You can reform and say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to have New Year's resolutions and all the rest of it. Isaiah said, all our righteousness is filthy rags and rags in the sight of God. If you take a pig and take him into your living room and into the bathroom, give him a good bath, wash him down with some Chanel number no. five, put a ribbon around his neck, bring him in the living room. You say, now I've got a new pig. He's, he's turned into a perfect gentleman. Look at him sitting over there. You open the door, let the pig out and see where he goes. His heart hasn't been changed. Only the outside had been changed. And that's the way with some of us. We've been changed some on the outside to conform to certain social standards or certain things that are expected of us in our churches. And yet down inside, we've never been changed. Now that's what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. He said, Nicodemus, you need changing inside. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. You must be born from above. That's a supernatural act of God. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, disturbs you about the fact that you've sinned against God. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit 
regenerate you. That's when you're born again. And then the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart to help you in your daily life. You don't leave here alone without any help. The Spirit of God goes with you from now on to give you assurance, to give you joy, and to produce fruit in your life and to teach you the Scriptures. You can't reform. That's not enough. And you can't imitate. You try to imitate Christ. They used to have, a, there was a book Sheldon wrote called In His Steps, and people thought that all you had to do is try to follow Jesus and try to do the things He did, and you'd get to heaven. You can't do it. We can't live up to the Sermon on the Mount. You try living up to the Sermon on the Mount, literally. You can't do it. You don't have that kind of spiritual strength. I told a story that happened many years ago from a couple in Oklahoma. And they had read about this play in New York called My Fair Lady. And they told everybody they were going to New York and they were going to see My Fair Lady. What they didn't know is that it was sold out four or five months in advance. When they got there, they couldn't buy any tickets. So they said, what are we going to do? Our friends all back home will think we saw My Fair Lady. We're going to be embarrassed. So they hit upon a good idea. They went over and they bought one of the books that you could buy for a dollar that told all about the play. And then they saw people, they waited till people started coming out of the theater and they saw some of them throwing their tickets aside that had been cut in half. And so they went over and picked up some tickets. Then they began to hum and sing. I could have danced all night or on the street where she lives or one of those tunes in My Fair Lady. And when they got home, they were humming the tune. They had the book that told about it and they had the tickets. And everybody thought they'd been to see My Fair Lady. And that's the way you are. You know the religious language. You can sing the songs. You can even pray the prayers. The only thing is you haven't been to the foot of the cross and been born again. That's the message Jesus was trying to get over to this religious leader. Now, to be born again means, in Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. In Romans, Paul speaks of it as being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it being a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In Peter, Peter says, partakers of a divine nature. John calls it passing from death unto life. The new birth brings about a change in the whole philosophy and manner of living. Now, how is it accomplished? What happens? Well, there's a mystery. Jesus said the wind blows where it listeth, and you cannot tell from whence it cometh or where it goeth. You can see the result. Now, the other day, I did not see, when we had that terrible storm a couple days ago, I did not see the wind, did you? I saw the effects of it. I saw limbs flying by parts of a roof torn off flying by, the dust going by, the willow trees bending over. I saw the results of the wind, but I never actually saw the wind, and neither did you. You see, the wind blows where it listeth, Jesus said. There's a mystery to it. And the analogy of natural birth, I think, applies here. You see, Natural birth is the moment of conception. Then there's the nine months of gestation. And then there's actual birth. Now, you may be in one of those stages tonight. This may be the moment of conception for you. It may be another stage of gestation, or it may be actual birth. Only the Holy Spirit could answer that question. That's the mystery of it. There is a mystery that I cannot explain to you. And Jesus did not attempt to explain it to Nicodemus. You see, that's why we're to come by faith to Christ. We can never understand it. Our little finite minds cannot understand the infinite. Our finite minds cannot understand the mighty God. We come by simple childlike faith and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do, you are born again. But it happens this way. First, there has to be the reception of the Word of God. And I believe that is conception. 
1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then in Romans 10, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now tonight you are hearing and you're hearing the word of God and that's the first step. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching or declaration or proclamation to save them that believe. It sounds foolish that men can stand up and use words out of a Bible and that has power to penetrate your heart and change your life. But it does because it's God's holy word. This is not an ordinary book. This is a living book, a living word. And then there's the work of the Holy Spirit, as I've already explained. He convicts. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And then he indwells. He changes us. He changes our wills, our affections, our objectives for living, our disposition. He gives us a new purpose and new goals. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. And then he indwells. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Does God, the Holy Spirit, live in you? If there's a doubt about it, pick up that telephone if you're watching by television and call that number. And a counselor will be there to help you to make sure that you have been born again. You remember the story in the Bible of Naaman? Naaman was the general commander in chief of all the armies of Syria, and Syria is much in the news these days. He was commander in chief. He had everything. The king had honored him. But he was a leper, and he knew that in a short time he was going to be thrown out of the military, and he was going to be just a, a person going around with a little bell saying, keep away, keep away, keep away. I'm a leper, I'm a leper, I'm a leper. And he heard a little slave girl from Israel tell about a wonderful man that could heal him over in Israel. And he went to his king, and the king said, if anybody in Israel can heal you, please go. And he went. And when he finally came to this man after a number of experiences, the prophet said, go to the Jordan and dip seven times. And on the seventh time, you will be healed. Told the servant to tell him that, in fact, the prophet didn't even come out to see the general. The general was there in all of his uniform and all of his men, and the prophet just stayed back in the kitchen somewhere. Didn't even come out and greet him. Just sent word to him. And the general turned away in disgust. But one of his captains said to him, or one of his aides said, Sir, if he had told you a hard thing, you would have done it. He said, Go to the Jordan. He said, yeah, but the Jordan River is muddy and our rivers are clear. That Jordan River can't do anything. He said, but why don't you try, sir? You're a leper. You've got to do something. So the general went to the Jordan River and he dipped himself four or five times and he said, see, the leprosy is still there. It doesn't do any good. But sir, he said seven times. So Naaman went down for the seventh time and when he came up, his skin was clean and whole. The thing that had saved him was the fact that he did what the prophet had told him. The greatest prophet of them all is Jesus Christ. And he says, you must be born again. How do you become born again? Repenting of sin, that means you're willing to change your way of living and you'll say to God, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Simple, childlike, and then by faith receive him as your Lord and Master and Savior, and then be willing to follow him in a new life of obedience in which the Holy Spirit helps you as you read the Bible and pray and witness. If there's a doubt in your mind that you have been born again, I hope you'll settle it before you leave here tonight because the Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You just can't come to God any time you want to. You can only come when the Holy Spirit is drawing and He's speaking to you tonight in answer to the prayers of thousands of people in Idaho and throughout the country. Come to Christ tonight. Why do I ask people to come publicly? We've seen several thousand people do what I'm going to ask you to do. I ask you to come publicly because Jesus said, if you don't acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. 
He hung publicly for you on the cross. Certainly you can come in front of this audience in this beautiful stadium and receive him into your heart. I'm going to ask you to do that right now. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you, but I'm going to ask you to come and stand here in front of the platform. And this is a symbolic act of an inward decision that you're making. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature, then you can go back and join your friends. God bless you. It's wonderful to know that tonight can be a night of new beginning for you. You say, well, how? Take a moment to call that number on your screen or to write to Billy Graham tonight or this week and let him know about your desire. And we'll send you some helps through the mails that will encourage you and help you make your decision for Jesus Christ. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. Toward the battle, into the darkness, anytime, anywhere. This is our mission, sharing hope. Jesus. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, always. school teacher, the mother of six children, was kidnapped some time ago by five drug addicts. She was stabbed 20 times in the back. Her captors told the police that they were warlocks, that is, male witches, and that they were devil worshippers. In Montana, some time ago, a 22-year-old social worker picked up a hitchhiker near Yellowstone National Park. And the hitchhiker then shoots his victim in the head, brutally attacks the dead body, and tells the police that he worships the devil. In Miami Beach, a 69-year-old retired woman is viciously attacked by a young woman who later tells reporters very happily that for the last five years, she has been worshiping Satan, and this is her sacrifice to the devil. Story after story after story like that could be told tonight if we only had time to tell it. The scripture has a great deal to say about the devil and demons. In fact, the whole Bible is the story of a conflict between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. And the scripture I would like for you to turn to is Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, two verses, the 10th and 11th verses of Deuteronomy. There shall not be found among you anyone who maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or who useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of mediums, or a wizard. You remember the story of Saul. He broke that law of God. He had lost contact with God. God had left him. No more blessing upon Saul, the great king of Israel. And so he decided that he was going to consult a medium and try to get a message from Samuel. He consulted the medium. He was successful in talking briefly with Samuel. 
but he was killed shortly thereafter as the judgment of God fell upon Saul and his family. Now, Americans at this hour are vacillating, according to the latest polls. Some deny the existence of the devil altogether, but others have an unnatural fascination with the devil and with demons and with exorcism and other things in their cult. And because of the success of the exorcist and many new films are being made on the subject of the devil and evil right now, a pastor who saw one of these films said recently, it was obnoxious, repulsive, disgusting, pornographic, and obscene. I myself have not seen any of these films. I do not intend to expose myself to this type of thing. But a Jesuit priest who saw one. But a Jesuit priest who saw one of these films said in his survey among university students, most students that have seen the films wish they'd never seen them. Now, this is not a phenomenon just in America. It's also in Germany, where there are thousands of witches. It's also in Great Britain. A British bishop said the other day that Great Britain is turning to black magic as their interest in Christianity declines. And I believe that one of the problems in the world today that is not recognized is the great intensification and acceleration of evil in the world at this moment because the devil knows his time is short. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ may be drawing near. And the scripture teaches that as the coming of the Lord draws near, the activity of the devil will intensify. The kidnapping, the violence, the terror all over the world, I believe, is a part of demonic activity. One authority says that witchcraft is growing faster than any other religion in the Western world. And one reason I think that young people get involved is because it does get them involved. It's a return to nature, in a sense, a worship of the natural gods, finding some power within themselves are broadening their minds, some of them through drugs and some without drugs. But thousands of young and old alike are dabbling in their cult at this moment. Shops in our cities are selling all types of things that go along with their cult. One university professor, not this university, but a university professor said some time ago that there were dozens of covens on their campus. Now, Coven, as you know, is a circle of witches and warlocks, and warlocks are male witches, numbering 13. They're always number 13. And they have their rites and their rituals and their literature and their witchcraft. Now, what is right and what is wrong? What is false and what is true? The Bible has a lot to say about it, and I'm going to cover a big subject in a very few minutes tonight. First, the Bible teaches there is a devil. There is a devil. We meet him in the third chapter of Genesis, and we don't get rid of him till the end of the book of Revelation. He's all the way through the Bible. And in the Bible, we find that he's a person. He walks, he talks, he tempts, he lies, he flatters, he kills, he works miracles, he counterfeits, he oppresses, he afflicts, he influences, he destroys, he quotes and misquotes scripture, he possesses, he inflicts bodily injury, he sows discord in the church, he spreads false doctrine. Those are the things that this personality in the Bible called the devil does according to the scripture. Now he's called in the Bible, he's called Satan, he's called the devil, He's called a fallen angel. He's called a roaring lion. He's called the prince of demons. He's called a wolf, a prowler, Beelzebub, the dragon, the serpent, Lucifer, a great light, a star, a betrayer, an adversary, a wonder worker, a liar, the father of lies, the god of this world, the prince of this world, 
and the prince of it and power of the air. His is described in the Bible as the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of evil, the kingdom of unrighteousness, the kingdom of hatred, sin, death, hell, and the grave. He produces false miracles, false spiritual experiences, false tongues, the father of fakery. He has a false church, a false gospel, a false plan of salvation, a false trinity, false preachers, false prophets. That's what the Bible says about the devil. Now the word Lucifer means light bearer, one who shines. It's a deceptive light. It's not the true light. It's a deceptive light. It's a false light. He promises freedom, liberty, and life, but he produces only sorrow, slavery, and death. He's a deceiver, and he's trying to deceive thousands of you young people tonight by promising you that if you only follow him and serve him and bow down to him and live for him, that he will give you freedom, liberty, and life. But actually, he gives you sorrow, slavery, and ultimately eternal death in hell. Now the devil is resisted in the Bible by the characters of the Bible that God honored and blessed and loved. He was resisted by Job. He was resisted by Jesus. He was resisted by the disciples. He was cast out of heaven. And the Bible says he will eventually and ultimately be cast into hell, the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now you say, how did the devil originate? Why, why did God allow the devil? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. The apostle Paul calls evil the mystery of iniquity. There are just some things we don't know. God did not reveal it to us. And if God did not reveal it to us, we shouldn't be delving into speculation. But there are some hints in the Bible about where the devil originated. In Isaiah, the 14th chapter, and Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. In the 14th of Isaiah, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground? For thou hast said in thy heart, and then it says five times, I will, putting his will against God's will. Listen to it. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. In other words, there came a time somewhere back in eternity when Lucifer, the highest and greatest of all of God's created beings, led a rebellion against God. And it seems that about a third of the angels joined him in the rebellion. They were cast out of heaven. They landed on this earth. And the devil and these fallen angels who have now become demons are active on this planet. They're under judgment. They've been defeated by the cross and the resurrection. They are ultimately going to be cast into hell. But in the meantime, they are active and increasing their activity. Now, the sin of Lucifer was pride. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be above God. He wanted to be the greatest being in all the universe. So he led the rebellion. You say, where did he get this idea? We don't know. How did sin enter his heart? We don't know. Why did God allow him? We don't know. This is wrapped up in the mystery of God. It's wrapped up in the mystery of iniquity. It's something we don't understand. And it'll never be resolved until the battle of Armageddon when our Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back followed by thousands of the armies of heaven and he's going to destroy forever the devil and his angels. 
and we'll be rid on this planet of the greatest plague and the greatest thing that has ever happened to any planet anywhere in the universe. Now the second thing, what about demons? The New Testament makes one thing clear. There's one devil, there are many demons. You remember the story in the fifth chapter of Mark, the man of the Gadarenes? This man was possessed of a devil, many demons. And it had affected his mental, his emotional, and his physical faculties. And, he, and Jesus held conversation, not with the man, but with the demons. Jesus never talked to the man at all. He talked to the demons. And there are several things about that man that interest me today and are relevant at this hour in America. He was naked. He was a streaker. He was violent. He was violent. And look at the violence in the country. And he wanted, he wanted the demons to be cast, or the demons wanted to be cast into the swine, into the pigs. You see the combination you have here? You have violence, nakedness, self-destruction, and pigs. What do some of the people call the police today? Some of the more violent people. Pigs. Is there a connection? I don't know, but it's quite interesting that this demon-possessed man that Jesus encountered would have all of those things that we're wrestling with today. Now, the origin of demons, as I said a moment ago, is unclear. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And the Bible says in Revelation 12, the devil and his angels fight against Michael, the archangel, and his angels. Now you say, what about exorcism? Well, do you know what the word exorcism actually means? The word exorcism means expelling spirits by a religious act or a religious service. That's how what it means, expelling an evil spirit. And Jesus, of course, was the greatest of all exorcists. He commanded the demons and the forces of evil to come out of people. And that man that I was telling about a moment ago, he commanded this legion of demons to leave, and they left and went into the swine, and the swine went hurtling into the sea and destroyed themselves. Now, the fact of exorcism is a reality but it's misunderstood. Some of the modern interpretations originated actually in pagan practices. Magic formulas and rituals to expel evil spirits have been practiced for centuries in primitive societies, usually accompanied by violence and infliction of pain. There's one tribe in India that I read about where they take a cotton wick soaked in oil and they light it and they stuff it up the nostrils of the person who is supposed to be possessed of demons. And the cruelty of professional exorcists in many parts of the world is beyond our comprehension and understanding. Now, Matthew, the eighth chapter, tells us that when the disciples brought to Jesus many that were demon-possessed, he cast out the spirits, not with a long ritual, as we're being told today. But by a word, his word, and his disciples cast out demons, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By a word. The power of the name of Christ. And Mark 16, 17 says, And these signs shall accompany those who have believed in my name. They shall cast out demons. However, there's a warning. Don't go around using some sort of hocus pocus and say, be gone in the name of Jesus. It won't work. You have got to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you have to be walking in the Spirit and you have to know that that's a demon and you have to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have the authority of God's Word back of you. Behind the name of Jesus stands the power of Almighty God. Now, how do you keep from being possessed or harassed 
and vexed by demons. You see, demons have power only, that is, as far as a Christian is concerned, only when you are walking in some sin. If you allow a besetting, besetting sin to get a grip on you, you've opened the way for the demons in your life. As we walk with Christ, if you're a Christian and you're walking in the Spirit and God is with you and all known sin has been confessed and you're in fellowship with Christ, then you can walk in the middle of the most dangerous spiritual situations and be protected by God. You can claim authority over the devil and his angels. But I'll tell you what the devil will do. He'll bluff as far as he can. He'll take all the ground that you give him. Give him an inch, he'll take a foot. A woman possessed of the spirit of divination, you remember, bothered Paul in Philippi. And he said, you evil spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of this woman and leave her alone. And the evil spirit came out. Now, I personally have had that experience a few times, but very few. And I was trying to think only once in America. I remember twice in India. I remember once in Africa and once in the Far East, twice in the Far East. And on each occasion, very interestingly, the person involved used the same three words. I am free. Christ can free you. But it's not done with a ritual. It's not done with the way we're, it's being depicted. It's done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every believer, every Christian, has the right to pray that prayer with a person who is in trouble. Now, a great many things that we call demon possession are not demon possession at all. For example, mental problems are not caused by demons. Some may be, but many are not. And so you have to have discernment that only the Holy Spirit can give you as to what is demon activity and what is normal activity or the activity of nature. You say, well, how do we overcome demons when they bother us and harass us? I want you to listen to this. First of all, be sure you know Christ. I do not believe that a true believer in Jesus Christ can be possessed by a demon. You can be vexed by a demon. You can be harassed by a demon. But I do not believe the scripture teaches you can be possessed by a demon. Now, Satan filled Judas. Satan filled Ananias and Sapphira who were professing believers. We're told in scripture. But are you sure that you know Christ? Do you know that Jesus Christ lives in your heart? Have you settled it? Come to Christ tonight while you can. As Bill Cepeda said he did five years ago. As Mike said he did three years ago. Come to Christ. Surrender your life to him and make sure about that. And you will have a power living in you that is greater than he that is in the world. You will have the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God in your life. And you can resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. The second thing, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The scripture says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you tonight as a believer, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? You can be filled not through some emotional ecstasy. You can be filled by a simple act of faith. How did you receive Christ? You received him simply by faith. All right, you're filled the same way. You can say, I am filled by the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit by faith. You see, the moment you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart. And as you surrender everything that he points out that's wrong in your life, then he fills you 
and you're filled and you produce fruit. Now, every Christian has the gifts of the Spirit. You have a gift. I don't care who you are and how lowly a Christian you are, you have a gift. And you ought to be utilizing that gift in the body of Christ, and you ought to be utilizing that gift in witnessing for Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is something different. The fruit of the Spirit is different than the gifts of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is produced by the Holy Spirit. Love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and so forth. That's produced by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you are living in the Spirit, producing the fruit of the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, Satan cannot get inside of you at all. But let me tell you, sin, even the slightest little sin, will grieve the Holy Spirit and open the way for demonic activity. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor desert you. I will not forsake you. Now, the third thing, watch for the schemes of the devil. The scripture says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, the devil is going to exploit your personality quirks, the lust of the flesh, the natural physical drives that you have, hunger, as he did Jesus. He tempted Jesus when Jesus was hungry. The devil always comes to you when you're weak to tempt you, to harass you, to trouble you. Watch out for those moments when you're weak, when you're hungry. He also uses the sex drive. Sex is a powerful drive that we all have, and the devil will use it if we give him a half an inch. For our struggle, the scripture says, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual for forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And the scripture says, therefore, take up the full armor of God, that ye may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And then the Bible outlines the armor that we should have. And I want to ask you tonight if you have your armor on. Have you checked it? First, check it. The belt. Paul said, having your loins girt with truth. Now, the belt or the, gir or the girdle was a belt about six or seven inches wide that went around a Roman soldier. And by the way, when Paul was writing this in Ephesians, he was in a Roman jail and a Roman guard was guarding him, so he just looked at his uniform and got his illustrations for how we Christians ought to be. And one was that belt, because you see, that belt or that girdle held everything else in place. And Paul says, have your loins girt with truth. In other words, learn the scriptures, learn the word of God. That's the reason when people come forward to receive thief Christ, we give them a Bible study and we get them involved in the scriptures, reading the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures. This is how we resist the devil. When Jesus Christ was tempted of the devil, what did he do, argue with the devil? No. He resisted the devil by quoting scripture. That's all he did, just quote scripture. He said, it is written. And when he was finished quoting the scripture, the devil would leave him and angels would come and minister to him. And then Paul said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate was made of bronze backed with tough pieces of hide. And the breastplate of righteousness it's what we get from Jesus Christ when we come to him as our Lord and Savior. Because our righteousness, our goodness is filthy rags in the sight of God. So you need a righteousness that has been provided for you. And it was provided for you by Jesus Christ on the cross. And we receive the breastplate of righteousness. So that when the devil shoots his fiery darts, they can't penetrate that breastplate. And then thirdly, he says, how about your boots? having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, that doesn't mean to go out and just preach the gospel. It means more than that. It means that you should have the peace of God in your heart, the serenity, the joy, the happiness that Christ gives should be in your heart so that when troubles come, Satan will not be able to get close to you. You see, Satan uses worry, anxiety, 
and tension to keep us off balance. Are you afraid? Do not fear, for I am with you, says God. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will uphold you with my right hand, says God in Isaiah 41. Are you worried about inflation? Everybody is. Bills are stacking up. Pressures of business closing in. Children getting out of hand. Are those are the things you're worried about? The scripture says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, will guard, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then fourthly, what about the shield? The Roman soldiers carried a shield. The scripture says, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Now, Roman's shield was two feet wide and four feet long, and it warded off the blows of the enemy. He would hide behind it when, Roman, when arrows would come against him. Satan is always shooting his missiles and his darts at us. We need the shield of faith. Trusting, believing in God, taking God at his word. And then fifthly, there's the helmet. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet is very important because it guards the brain, protected the head. There's a lot in the scripture to say about the mind. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Intellectually, you cannot come to Christ alone because your mind has a veil over it put there by the devil. But when you come to Christ, your mind is illuminated by the Holy Spirit and the things that you didn't understand before, you now accept by faith and you put on that helmet and that helmet protects you against the enemy. The devil is going to try to cause you to doubt. He's going to try to cause you to question. I remember my own father. He had been told by a preacher many years ago that he'd committed the unpardonable sin and my father thought all those years that he couldn't come to Christ. He hadn't committed it. He didn't even know what it was. And it was years later that he found the joy of his salvation again. You see, Satan had sidetracked and perverted the scriptures. And then there's the sword, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the offensive weapon. You see, our Roman's blade was about 24 inches long, and he would twist and turn, keep his balance always, thrusting. And the Scripture says that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus used the sword, the Word of God. That's the reason it's important to study the Bible, to know the Bible, to learn the Bible. And I believe this. I believe that Christians and believers are going to go through a period of trouble and difficulty. We may go to jail. We may be killed for our faith, as many people in other parts of the world have been. We're not going to escape. It's on the way. And the way to get prepared is to learn this book so that when they do call upon you to witness, when they do call upon you, you know the scriptures. And you can quote the word of God and be a witness and resist the devil. And the scripture says he will flee. And then the seventh and the last thing is to pray. Pray without ceasing, said Paul. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. Praying and Bible study. Check your armor. Is it in place? One final word. The final victory. The devil and his works and death and hell and the grave have been nullified. They've been destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. The victory is won. The victory is assured. Till that final day, there's a lot of suffering, a lot of fighting, a lot of battling, but we're on the winning side. And the scripture teaches that Jesus Christ has won the victory. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, 
by the blood of the Lamb. There is power in the blood.